welcome everybody to Not So Famous Achievers. Weekly conversations with some of the world's most amazing but not so famous achievers on what they did and how they did it and what you can learn from their journey. With your hosts, Will Christ and Robert White. Hey guys. Well, Robert, we have a conversation ahead of us today with Peter J. Byrne III. And this guy is an entrepreneur on steroids. So welcome, Peter. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it. So catch us up to date on this rocket ship that you've been on starting all these businesses. Sure. At the age of six, I followed my dad around on a golf course all the time. And I noticed how the dumpers trying to reach the green on a water hole would knock their balls in the water. And it dawned on me that they were losing a lot of money, and it offered an opportunity. So after we did the round, uh, my dad went to the clubhouse, and I ran home, got my waiters, and set up a, a little lemonade stand where I'd wait in and sell them back their golf balls. Well, before the, uh, <laughs> the country club escorted me off the golf course, I'd made 50 bucks in two hours, and I was only six. So I thought... Wow, I could get paid like equivalent to six months worth of of my hours a week just by being smart. So that was kind of the impetus. And basically, I have always started little businesses. First official business until I was a freshman in college at the University of Virginia and took an entrepreneurship. Back then, there were no schools in the country that can spell entrepreneur. There were four schools that had some sort of semblance of an entrepreneurship uh, class. Challenge in the McIntyre School of Commerce, where you didn't get into third year, and this was a fourth year elective that had blocked to get into it. But nevertheless, I nothing ventured nothing to gain. The professor explained why I merited as a lowly first year student. All right, Burns, if you could convince the classmates who busted their butts to get into my class, got into McIntyre, did everything the right way. If they let you in, I let you in. Well, you know what? I got in, and I led the class, and I did my first business. I imported mopeds from Europe into the United States to rent at American resorts. That was my class. I tried it that summer on Nantucket Island off the coast of Massachusetts. Our family's summer home. I made 55000 in 10 weeks in a dirt lot. Team Opeds, um, kind of that was the end of my college lecture every year <laughs> back to my professor retired, and that started the ball rolling. I'm curious, I think there are a few universities now that teach entrepreneurship with some kind of gravity and some kind of result focus, but it seemed to me that most of them that I've been asked to speak at or that I've learned. Uh, they are done by professors that have never created anything except you're, you're except exactly that. right. Exactly right. So I had the opportunity to teach my own brand of entrepreneurship at the Baird Honors College at ASU um, as a an adjunct faculty member. My daughter was attending there, and I started Ready Fire Aim, and the course became one of the most popular ones on campus. Nineteen students produced thirteen business plans. I actually started five companies. This was back in two thousand five. Second semester, I had 94 students in four different classes, and I infuriated the business school professors. <laughs> <laughs> I started talking about tenure being communism. Didn't go over well. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a, a rival university, Grand Canyon University, invited me the second year um, because I wasn't actually invited back to ASU. <laughs> And I, I, I was able to co-found the College of Entrepreneurship in the United States at Grand Canyon University. That was back in 2007. Wow. All professors were handpicked by me as bona fide entrepreneurs and also verified by the accreditation standards of being having a master's or PhD. And we were ranked number two program in the United States in six months for teaching entrepreneurship. Pretty cool. All right. All right. So talk about uh, talk about some of the companies that you've started. 
every category for restaurant and bars. And that was because I learned that restaurants and bars have more partners than they're aware of. <laughs> One of my friends was a bartender and he showed me how other bartenders would become the unknown partners of the owner of the place. And I, I vowed at that point never to get involved in an all cash business to belong to somebody else. So I've started an engineering company in cost segregation studies and filed four patents on that back in 2008, using it for a number of different uh, opportunities no one else had actually thought of. I started a group home business in a special niche luxury houses. I had three 10 bedroom, 10 bath homes in the Dell Web community. Unfortunately, I opened up or I was trying to open up just before COVID hit. Oh, well. I've tried a lot of things. Not every one of them worked. A lot of the ideas are pretty good, um, but I've made a lot of money in, in several different businesses. I had a large travel company. I had a deal with the country of Vietnam. Uh, let's see. What else did I have? I've pretty much been in every single category of business you can think of because if it makes a profit, I get involved. Cryptocurrency, I was one of the first people to get you know into cryptocurrency, but not as a trader. I took the model of the company store that was set up where the gold rush, everybody needed a pickaxe and supplies. Whether they found the gold or not, the general store made the money. And I did the same thing with uh, cryptocurrency. I set up a cryptocurrency mining funding resource and an insurance program. They all needed it. Whether they made their fortune in crypto or not was, was secondary to me, but that was a great entree into that particular field. I've been in everything. Peter, I, I'm curious. Uh, many of the listeners to this message are people in companies thinking about, perhaps thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. You know, you've, you've gone to the point of actually teaching it to young people, but it, it sounds like you were like born to it and certainly honed some skills about it. What have you learned that would be of benefit to uh, our listeners, people that are maybe thinking about it or maybe starting out with a little idea? That little idea can manifest into a real business, but you're going to need the mentorship and you're really going to need the access to funding. So I took those two items and I created a methodology to actually put people into business. Now, I have a brand new launch program called the MillennialQueenMaker.com. I have created the MillennialQueenMaker.com, which targets the, the young people that never have a chance. They've gone to college. They owe a bunch of money. Um, they have uh, uh, accumulated these degrees that no one really cares about. There are no jobs. And they entered into like the serving industry as a temporary thing. And then of course, COVID wiped them out. So they were doubly screwed basically. And I was able to put together my methodology of teaching, mentoring, and providing capital on a loan basis to these individuals. We launched it. I have 90 applications in two weeks. Uh, we're going through the vetting process. I'm pretty excited about that. Likewise, anyone contemplating starting a business has the same resources available from me through Burns Funding. And Burns Funding uh, was an aggregate of all of the financial resources that I have accumulated in 45 years of business. I have approximately uh, $1.5 billion worth of loan capital available for me to deploy. I guarantee it. It's non-recourse money, and it allows people to try their their best and brightest business with our resources. So if you're a millennial woman, you can go to millennialqueenmaker.com. If you are anyone else, you can go to burnsfunding.com. And I can provide all of the educational components, the mentoring program, and the money for you to start. You have to get qualified, but I have an internal banker that qualifies you according to bank standards for access to my capital. And honestly, I don't know anyone who can do it quicker, faster, and easier and as many times, rinse and repeat as I do. Um, again, that was the interest I had on this program because not everyone knows about this. And 
through the resources such as your podcast and your and your uh, audience, I'm hoping to open up the doors to entrepreneurship to a lot more people. You know, I expected three tips or something like that. I should have known with an entrepreneur that you would see the need <laughs> and jump into it with a solution. Wow, that is exciting. Well, you know, it's all about doing it rather than talking about it. So I ended up with a hundred moped like bikes and things like that stores uh, around the world in only two years. Actually, it took me and I ran it for 20 years. And I can't tell you how many people asked me how I got my start. And I told them moped rentals, I imported and rented them and how they said, oh, I had that idea. And, you know, I must have heard that all 200 times. And every time I asked, where was your shop? They said, oh, no, I didn't actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> people people talk a good game, but they never actually take the plunge. I make it easier to take the plunge with my resources. All right. So, Peter, in in talking to people who who have this entrepreneurial bug, do you find that, that entrepreneurs are born or can anybody be an entrepreneur? Well, I would say that there are two distinct types of entrepreneurs. I'm what's known as a pure blood entrepreneur, like a pure blood vampire. That means I was born to be an entrepreneur. The, the other people are people who are stuck in a corporate environment, either have lost their job or wish they had lost their job and got out of it and actually tried something. But before you're, it's too late, you need to really look and see what the opportunities are. You solve a problem. That becomes a business you have. The mentorship is really important to be taught, and anyone can be taught. I have 20-year-old young people that are starting their own businesses. Now, it doesn't, doesn't have to be the end-all business. I encourage people to have multiple businesses, just like multiple streams of income, have multiple businesses. You find the right people to put in and work for you, and you work on your idea and you get the right help and the resources to be able to do it. So that's really what I focus my energies on. You know, we, uh, we focused here on your success, which is incredible. Uh, how about failure? What's the, well, have you had a big miss? I call, I call it practice or tuition. <laughs> Rather than finishing college, I paid tuition. And ideas, I can give you one spectacular failure. I'm a preppy. I went to prep school. I went to UVA. I went to Harvard. I grew up in New Canaan, Connecticut. I like preppy clothes. I lived on Sanibel Island every winter in Nantucket in the summer. Well, on Sanibel Island, I thought, gosh, you know, rather than keep ordering from the old University of Virginia clothier that I had shipped uh, years after I got out, why don't I own a preppy store? So I spent $100,000 getting a great store renting it out, improving it, stocking it. And I was the only customer. I failed, <laughs> I failed to note that why are you going on vacation in a little Gulf of Mexico island to go buy clothes that you buy when you're back home? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that, that's a resounding failure that I remember. And I failed at other things too. But again, it's not failure, it's practice. Uh-huh. Well, I think a hallmark of entrepreneurship is renaming things you know <laughs> we're good at that <laughs> well you know also in america we're the home of the second and third and fourth chances we're applauded when we get the crap kicked out of us and get back and do it again other yes. countries you're one hit wonders you fail everybody remembers that the media boasts about it and you're dead on the water here oh well you get back up and do it again let me share something with you this is Entrepreneurial Leap by Gino Wickman. This is his project now after EOS, after the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And and what he what he's saying is that there are people who aren't equipped to be an entrepreneur. And he talks about he talks about six different traits of an entrepreneur. Let's see what see what you think about this. He says number one, you have to be a great visionary. You have to see. You got to see what's not there. You got to see the place of value where you can bring value to something. Next, you have to be passionate. And I can certainly sense that you're passionate about these things. He said you have to be a problem solver. You have to be driven. You have to be a risk taker. And you have to be responsible, i.e., you don't blame anybody. 
Does that make sense to you that this is a core of entrepreneurial success? Well, you're dead on, but I also want to point out that people that don't necessarily have any or all of those skill sets become part of an entrepreneurial team. And as long as they have the visionary and have the risk taker and have all of those other attributes that your leap author put together, combined, uh -huh. you have an entrepreneurial team. You create a business. Not one person is a business. What was that old saying? No man is an island. Uh -huh. Well, it's, a, it's the same thing for entrepreneurship endeavors. These businesses require a team, and the team is a component of all of those factors that you just listed. Uh huh. So if somebody was bored, frustrated, uh, wanted to get out of their current uh, place that they had to go to work every day, but they hate it, they want to get out of that. If they don't have all of these, they can go find people who do. Yes, exactly. Well, that's an important piece. I mean, we're really we're really talking about the entrepreneurial spirit and how how people can bring that off. Because what I know is that a visionary with all of these needs other people around. I certainly There's agree no with that. Question about it. You totally need a team around you. I couldn't function. In as many businesses as I have running, I have a dozen businesses running at any one time, plus startups, it seems like every other day I come up with something. But uh -huh. I need to run it by people who have the skill sets, the smarts, the, the complementary energy to make it work. And then I'm all about partners. I do not believe in employees. I dislike the terms employees. I want to make them my partners. I'll uh -huh. loan people money to become my partners in business because I believe that the need to create, the need to be self-sufficient, independently finance, uh, you know, finance yourself is so important and so inbred. We beat it out of us. We The corporate altars to worship that way too long. People forget that these big corporations started from somebody like you and me. It yeah. started from an entrepreneur. Henry Ford sitting there in his house trying to uh, to make that engine run. <laughs> I've heard that story so many times. Thomas Edison with 10,000 ways not to have an electric light work, you know? Right, right. right. All right, so what are you finding? Now, I'm not it's it's not so much about women, but it's about what are you finding that is changing for women to now respond to your request or your offer to become entrepreneurs and supported offer entrepreneurs? Well, I think they're realizing that in the corporate hierarchy, there are so few positions that are filled with women CEOs. I mean, it's predominantly male. And if they don't make the rules themselves, they're not going to be the CEO. They may as well be CEO of themselves. And this is something I'm trying to teach. I also have two daughters who have given me nine beautiful grandchildren, and four of those grandchildren are women, are little girls. I am always advocating to my daughters and now my granddaughters to be financially independent of males. Make your own money. Women are smarter than we are. We just have to accept that fact. They're multitaskers. They simply need to be given the same opportunities that we do by birthright as males. I like to extend that to them. Okay. So so you're saying that, that one of the shifts has been uh, a shift in the availability of funding and of mentorship for women as no question. No question. We're finally taking them seriously. I always have. I prefer complementary energy. With males, we're competitive by nature. There's only one alpha male in my organization. You're talking to them. So I surround myself with very competent, very bright women who, who support me. It is by nature that they have complementary energy to a male. They don't compete with me. They compete with each other. Oh, yeah. But not, not the man. I attended an executive uh, training years ago where uh, it's just four students and two trainers for 10 days. Pretty intense. And there uh, was a little time at the end for questions and answers. And somebody asked, uh, what's the difference? What have you found as a difference between men and women? And their answer is interesting. And I don't know if it's supported by any research. It explained a lot of my own uh, accomplishment in life. 
since I had 80% women in, in my company. And they said the difference is that men, in terms of their essential purpose, are after status, position, and power. Women, in their essential purpose, are up to getting things done. And it was like a light went off when they said that. And then they went on to say that unsuccessful men are the men that surround themselves with other men who then fight for status, position, and power, the competitive thing. Unsuccessful women are the ones that go for status, position, and power instead of honoring that need to get things done. And I, I was fascinated with that. And I, it explained a lot of what had worked for me unconsciously. Uh, I didn't have that awareness going in. But I've always been impressed with that aspect of a difference between men and women, that women, are they'll collaborate, connect, do wild things. I, uh, you know, at some point, Will, you should, you should tell Jennifer's story. <laughs> you know, about they get things done somehow. Oh, yes, they do. They get things done. <laughs> That's the Peter, this is a, a, a story. I'll make it a short story for you. But this was uh, five years ago. A friend of mine came to me and said, Will, you told me that you would be willing to help because, you know, I help find uh, jobs for people who are disabled. And, and he said, Will, you, you said you would always find something in your organization and so I said, well, sure, let's hear. He said, well, I want to talk to you. I want to share with you a woman who it has a master's degree in family, uh, you know, marriage and family counseling. Uh, she's got a, a bachelor's degree. She did it all face to face with people. Uh, and and she is she knows computers backward and forward better than you and I put together. She said she has muscular dystrophy and she can only move three fingers on her left hand. She is in a, an electric wheelchair, has a has a respirator. She's got nursing all the time, and and she has gone on ninety eight different job interviews, and no one has offered her anything. And I said, "Well, okay, I'm a good Boy Scout. Let's see what we can do." Well, she came on board, and within six months, I now she was on a you know a. a, a uh, she was being sponsored by another organization. Her her compensation was being paid, and, and I said said Jen, I want you to come come work with me, uh, but you know I I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. So would you be willing to uh, spend a little time telling me what your limitations are, so that maybe I could shape the job to fit you? And she said sure. So came back after the weekend when we were meeting again and. And I said, well, did you get a chance to make that list? She said, sure. So I pulled out my, my yellow pad, ready to write, and I said, well, tell me. And she said, well, I spent three hours thinking about it, and I have to tell you, I have no limitations. <laughs> I said, Jen, what do you mean you have no <laughs> limitations? You're sitting there in an electric wheelchair with 24-hour nursing. You, you can only move three fingers of your left hand. Uh, you, 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 you've got a, a respirator. What do you mean? She said, I have no limitations. And I said, well, and I got very frustrated at that point. I, I, I'm embarrassed by that, but I did. And I said, okay, show me. I said, see that box over there? It was about a six foot long box, three feet high and square. I said, that box is filled with 50 three ring binders that are all wrapped up in bubble wrap. They need to be unboxed and they need to be placed on you see that space over there that's where the the uh, uh, bookshelf goes that they're going to go on and it'll probably have to be ordered and assembled so that's what you're that's what i want you to do and she said okay un, uh, you know, open the box take the three binders get the bookshelf put it on it <laughs> and I, at that point i was just frustrated and i said fine left came back three days later and you know what i found peter Here's that done. bookshelf. It's not only just done. There's no mess from the box. All the the the, the three ring binders are on this beautiful bookshelf that's been assembled, and they all had and every shelf had a label on it. And I said, Jen, did you do that? She said, Well, yes. And I said, How did you do that? <laughs> How in the world did you do that? And she said, Well, Will, you know, 
for for 34 years, people have not understood. My nurses are my hands and my feet. I have no limitations. He's a delegator. Oh, Oh. my gosh. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. She's been working for me for the last five years, and she gets it done. That's fantastic. That's a great story. And it just goes to show you we have perception of the inability to make things happen. That is our problem, not the people like Jennifer. That's right. That's right. I have no limitations. And and it seems to me that 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 is that last item on Gino's list is to be responsible, to not, uh, to have no limitations. You don't make excuses. You don't make excuses. Yeah. The moment you start making excuses, then you've, you've devalued your own ability. You know, this might be a good, good time to take a short break and uh, kind of breathe in this incredible uh, treasure of being able to interview Peter today. Time for a break. Well, we're going to give you one quick thought here that uh, plays into what we've been talking about here today. Our two hosts have lived extraordinary lives and been extraordinary entrepreneurs, and Robert White, certainly one of them. He mentors extraordinary entrepreneurs and executives just like you, people who want better results from their leadership performance. He shows them how to turn those results into increased personal joy and satisfaction as well. Robert founded and led two large training industry success stories. He's been there and done that, and his experience will help you find and achieve that extraordinary success you seek in your life. So why wait? Reach out and see what Robert can do for you today. Just email him at robert at extraordinarypeople.com, robert at extraordinarypeople.com, and start living the extraordinary life you've earned. Traction Tools is the EOS software for visual collaborative problem solvers like you. Built to manage each key component of your business, including vision and traction, data, people, meetings, and even process. The new digital whiteboard helps you illustrate, communicate, and work together throughout the decision-making process. And our new document drive makes file sharing even easier. So, if you want to save time and reduce repetitive tasks with easy automations... You really should take a look at Traction Tools and their EOS software. Sign up for a 30-day free trial at MyTractionTools.com. That's MyTractionTools.com. It would be a good time, Peter, for you to talk about uh, how we can support you. Well, I'll tell you what. I love to be around achievers, people that walk the walk rather than talk about it. You're obviously both accomplished entrepreneurs in your own right, creating the tools necessary that I would delegate to the people that I'm surrounded with to work with. So I don't, I'm not hands-on per se in in technical applications for all the ways to make the workflow work better. I am the visionary. I think from the top 30,000 foot view or higher, as everybody says, and I find the people that work with me the best to kind of fit the jigsaw puzzle of of a business like will was talking about before a visionary sees the end game before anyone even sees there is a game solves the problem before anyone realizes there is a problem and i think i can sort of attribute that thought process to the strategy i learned as a young chess player I started playing chess when I was five years old. And by the age of nine, I was one level beneath the grandmaster, which is something that people strive for their whole lives to achieve. Now, I loved it. And I got to the point where I could actually play six games simultaneous with people far older than me. And I'd either win or draw four out of the six. Well, that would piss everybody off. <laughs> little bit chess players for 30, 40 years. And honestly, the only reason I stopped playing chess is at the time, there were no women in that. And I'm motivated by female energy. So I got out of that, but I never forgot the strategic application for thinking ahead and thinking end game before 
anyone knows there is a game. So I love complementary skill sets and people that can help me who, who live out of the box like I certainly do, who can look at what I have and say, Peter, did you ever think of this? Can you fine tune this? Can you look at this? Can you, can you take a, another look at it? And I, I say, bring it on. I've got an awful lot of things going on. I need all the help I can get. Well, if people want to uh, be in touch with you, what's the best way? Uh, real simple, Peter at burnsfunding.com. But I really, I really suggest they go to my personal website. It has kind of like my history. It has my current ventures. It has future project. It has the history. And that's just peterjburn3.com. Peter J. Burns, the number three dot com. Peter, what would be helpful to you uh, if if I were to to invite you to my session room here in Laguna Beach? Could we invite uh, women who might want to participate in your project? I welcome that opportunity. I welcome you to put on a seminar where I can actually use my long term 45 years worth of experience and basically direct the conversation to the individuals who may have an idea, who may have um, a wish, a dream, and they don't know how to kind of put it together. It's kind of like a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, but I do have most of the pieces that I can assemble. I just need an audience. I can tell you something that I did that may lend itself to your thought process here. So I was one of the original 21 members of YEO with Michael Dell, Neil Balter, Peter, uh, what's Peter's last name? He started, um, gosh, what did he start? He started the big, huge real estate company, Peter Thomas of Vancouver. And there were, the only requirements back then was you had to be a multimillionaire and be under the age of 30. Okay. There weren't a lot of that back then because- Entrepreneurs were sort of the redheaded stepchildren. This was the age of Gordon Gecko and corporate madness. And it was like no one paid attention to we entrepreneurs. So in self-defense, we started our own organization. Well, YEO is now EO and has been for some time. And we're in 52 countries. And we would be an actual country-level economy if you ever used our gross sales and the people that are involved in, in this organization and you matched it against the entire income of some of the countries out there. So I started Club Entrepreneur because I saw EO becoming too political. It was We were wild men. We were cowboys. And all of a sudden, they became like a bunch of suits, which I don't resonate well with at all. That's the reason I didn't go into corporate world like my brothers did. And they achieve great success and all this good stuff. But you know what? My brother, Michael, runs the largest film company in the world called Lionsgate Entertainment. He and a friend bought it for $50 million about 15 years ago. And now it's, it's huge, right? I mean, they made $3 billion just on Hunger Games, yada, yada. My brother, Kevin, has his own kind of private hedge fund where you could be part of it if you have $20 million in cash as a starting point. He's got $5 billion. It's like... But they have they have analysts, stock analysts. They have IRS. They oh my god, forget it. I'm like whole different world. And that's and that's why your podcast appealed to me. No one knows who Peter Burns is. I'm sitting here in Del Mar by a fountain outside my office. My offices have always been since I moved out here, coffee shops that are outside. I have all my meetings there. Finally, I kind of got. To start official, I had to have some conference rooms, and <laughs> you know, so I've got I've got an office upstairs filled with these very smart young women, and one token male who's my CPA, who's in there. He's married. He's married to one of the women. But <clears throat> when I had Club Entrepreneur, which I started as a second generation YEL, I used to host events, and I'd host these events, and I'd have 200, 300 people show up, where I'd get some of my my contacts, like the chairman of the board of Avnet, who was a friend of mine. My little brother came and talked about the evolution of Lionsgate and on, on, on. And these, these club entrepreneur members would say, gosh, you know, we wish we could see each other way more often than 
you know, just the monthly meetings and, and we love connecting with everybody. And it kind of, it kind of forced me to think, how can I make that happen? Now at the time we were going through a catastrophic commercial real estate, you know, devastation. There was a lot of empty commercial property. So what I did is I rented an entire floor of a high rise in Phoenix and it had 30 offices and a big room to have the events. I think I'm one of the first people to ever get into co-working spaces. And that became my first of a dozen different co-working spaces to house my club entrepreneur people. <laughs> then we'd have these big events and I'd only have room for 30 entrepreneurs with their startup businesses, which was fantastic. But the other people would come up and they'd say, you know, we'd love to get to talk to you and all this kind of stuff. So finally I had my secretary I said, you know what, let's do a video email or weekly video email to all of our 10,000 members in Phoenix. And I said, let me invite them to sit down and talk with me for 45 minutes. And a thousand of them took me up on the <laughs> offer. So for eight months straight, I met with 1,000 club E members. And it was the most enlightening and, and vivacious experience I've ever done. I started three dozen businesses, raised millions of bucks before they even got back out to their cars. And I said, you know what? This is what I'm best at, connecting the dots. So to your point, bring them in. I'll connect the dots. I, I will tell you, I'm not going to promise, but uh, there's a pretty good chance I can start a bunch of businesses with who you bring into your room. <laughs> a, question, a question for you. Is it a one day? Is it a two day? A three day? What is it that would would be the the most impactful? Give me two or three hours. Uh -huh. Have a couple of breaks, and I will put my resources together, and I will wing it, which I'm famous of doing. There'll be really not much of an agenda. I will have one of the smart people in my office put together an agenda to give to the people and actually like to read stuff. Me, uh -huh. I need a couple of notes on the back of a, you know, a pad and, and I can put it together. Um, I'll have them come with their idea, what they'd like to do. I'll have them come with what they have available. Do they have good credit? Do they need their credit to be fixed? Do they have resources of their own? Do they need my resources? What do they want to do? What's their passion? And I'll yeah. hit those six points, find out what they're missing. And I'll substitute my resources for what they need to make the make the deal work. Great, great. Well, you know, it, with EOS, what our goal is is for people to live the EOS life, and that's five things. That is to do the things that you love doing, which obviously you're doing. To be doing it with people that you love. To be making a great, significant contribution to be compensated appropriately, and to have plenty of time left over for your other passions. And to me, the kind of thing you're talking about is one of the steps on the way to getting to that EOS life. I agree. You could use your system to implement the raw material that you bring into the room with me. Give me Good. 20 women. Give me 20 women. I'll, I'll fund as many of them as I can and use your system to Good. fill in the different pieces. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a sensitive question for you. It's not really about the current women that you have, but how do we go about bringing in a diverse group? Have you already dealt with that in addition to women, but women from a, a variety of, of cultures and races is one, but it's really cultures? Well, i tell you what. I have one of my, my fellow... He's not an employee, he's a business partner of mine who happens to be former military like I am, but he was 20 years retired major in the SAS. And if you're familiar with the British SAS, those are badasses. They are Delta Force quality. He has 7,500 jumps. He's also a, uh, whatever you jump off buildings and stuff, what do they call those? Whatever the heck he is. He's done TED Talks. He's brilliant. He has devised a um, lead generation system specifically to find potential millennial queens. He took one of the young women that I considered the paragon millennial queen, and he reverse engineered her in a process to go search out through a series of questions and ads and all this kind of stuff. While he's doing that, and it's plus a fortune, by the way, 
I came up with something pretty simple because I'm basically lazy. Let me get to the point as quickly as I can. Let me do 12 other things simultaneously. So I had remembered an experience where I needed a personal assistant. And I put an ad on one of the job boards called Indeed.com. And I basically said, I'm a diehard entrepreneur. I need somebody who can keep up with me and help me do all the details, which I lack. And I got 252 applications in two days. And to read 252 resumes, not so much. Lucky for me and lucky for her, a woman answered my ad and I hired her on the spot after I realized we are kindred spirits. She had an entrepreneurial bent, had started businesses with her former husband. After she left him, she had to pay him alimony. She came out from the East Coast here to the West Coast with her two teenage daughters and was willing to do anything. And she had her own resources. So she aspired just to have something to do and to teach her daughter's responsibility. But she had inherited quite a bit of money from her father. So it wasn't the financial bit that she came to me for as much as something to do and be appreciated. And I hired her on the spot. She's fantastic. She actually is an investor with me right now in several other things. And she has, she has become the human resources component of my non-business, uh-huh. <laughs> kind of like the mother figure for some of the younger women that work there. So as a result of that, I said, okay, Alistair has been wonderful doing his lead generation thing at thousands of dollars. Why don't I take an ad and structure it for a millennial queen to be? And I have been inundated. In one or two days, I have 90 perfectly suitable young women and not so young women. I even have men applying for the job to become millennial queens through my financial resources. They can earn while they learn and get hired by the company that I'm going to help them start. So she's yeah. not my employee. She's the employee yeah. of the LLC or the corporate entity that has been started with money I'm lending to her to go into business. Then she has the use of all my resources, my mentorship, my all, but your product could be a real component of huh. each one of these businesses with your guys' knowledge, and there's a way to implement all of it together. I see it, a natural synergy. Super. Peter, it sounds like uh, differing cultures, whether race or religion or origin of birth, really don't matter to you. Makes no difference. In my office right now, I have that single divorcee who has her own money, who's a partner. I have a young girl who's like the poster child that we created the template for my lead generation who's has white bread, South Dakota, business and economics degree, moved to Arizona, uh, saw something in one of the posts that I did or something on LinkedIn. She's there. I have a, a, a woman who's an, a Hindu who's from India, her family, brilliant engineer, genius. I met her while I was looking for uh, uh, an office didn't work out for the office that she was managing, but she just simply wanted to talk about entrepreneurship when she found out who I was. And she's in the office and a whole bunch of other ones, as diverse as you're going to get. A young girl who used to be homeless, her parents are both addicts. She was introduced to me by uh, the mother of one of her friends who was actually one of her teachers in middle school, asked me to give her a chance. And she's been working with me ever since. And she is becoming more and more adept and more confident in her abilities to have her own business. I've got the husband and wife team up there. They're both middle-aged. He is, he is the CPA, my token male, I call him. But his wife is a genius marketing expert. They worked for 15 years in the online store business and had been super successful. I'm talking the Amazon stores, the Shopify, and all that stuff. So... They had a client that had a $200,000 a year gross store, which is nothing. They personally built it to $30 million in sales. And the guy turned around and sold his digital real estate for $10 million in cash. They looked at each other and they said, what do we chop liver? We can do that. So <laughs> I got them on their ascension of their own consulting company where they connected with me on LinkedIn 
And I said, these online stores in every category are the perfect entree level for the millennial queens, the ones looking for passive income, as well as other people. And I'll lend the money to get into it. So they're mm -hmm. now with me full time. They moved down here from Michigan. That's not a tough sell, by the way, to move to Del Mar from <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> and they've become fantastic components of what's going on. They handle not just the online store component of what I'm doing, which becomes available to anybody, men, yeah. women, doesn't matter. It's passive income and it's a lot of income and can be started. They have such a unique proposition. $50,000 soup to nuts, they get you started and go. Their profits only come from half of the profits the first year. After that, you're on, you only make all the profits. And because they're so motivated, they don't make money unless they make your store make money. They're perfect partners. And Peter, they're, of course, do everything else too. Peter, we could talk to you for hours and hours, but we need to wrap up soon. Uh, just a personal question. Have you, uh, Del Mar, my experience of it is it's like the ideal beach town. I mean, it's really a beach town. And I thought you might know a guy named Don McQuiston. Is that a familiar name to you? No, and that's an unusual name. I do not know him. Uh, I mention it for two reasons. He he designed and produced a couple, several books for me. I was in a, uh, I published nine coffee table books about the national parks. Uh, but I also did our One World, One People book uh, was Don's design. But, and he has the all-time great company name, McQuiston and Daughter. Oh, <laughs> well, I should, I should meet him. I should meet him. <laughs> He's a wonderful, wonderful man. And his daughter is like the stereotype of the California girl. The first time I met her, she was walking out of the surf with a surfboard under her arm wearing a, a very revealing bikini. <laughs> and, and smart, 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 talented woman. Uh, uh, so my memories of Del Mar are positive. What, uh, Will, what do we need to do to wrap this up? Uh, well, uh, Peter, we will be in touch and we'll have some things up here so we can begin to draw on. Uh, I'm very eager to help help people who are who are open to changing their picture of their own abilities from if we could only change that out there, I could be successful too. If I could only change this in here, I'll be successful. Well said. So that's a passion that I have, and we will be in touch, and we will bring some things together here and and have a lot of fun. And Gentlemen, of thank good. you for the opportunity. I really appreciate this. Peter, thank deep, you. deep, deep thanks. You are fantastic. Well, so are you guys, and I really appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you in person. You don't live very far away. Take care. Take care. Well, there you have it. Another fascinating conversation with maybe a not so famous achiever, certainly a successful one right here on conversations with the not so famous achievers. Streaming live from the Cove here at the University of California, Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center on Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net.